Based on actual events, the film Angst presents a first-person perspective from the mind of a complete sicko as he fumbles his way through an awkward and brutal triple homicide. This macabre story opens with a froggy young fellow partaking in a pleasant afternoon walk through a quiet town, although sinister undertones almost immediately emerge. The stakes escalate when he finds an accessible house where he cordially announces his intentions and then executes them, both literally and literally. Through narration, we learn that he returns to the scene later on just so he could try to verify if this had all just been a dream. It wasn't, and the result was that he delivered a convenient package of evidence to the polizai. With him being in a daze and having no clear motive, the court's appointed psychologist elects to assign one to him to justify stuffing his little ass in the hole for the next 10 years. A little background reveals that the outlook was never promising. He was raised by his grandmother under a veil of shame due to his status as a true bastard child. She sent him to a monastery in the hope that he could contribute to society in some way, but he was ejected due to a proclivity for cruelty toward animals that could not be prayed out of him. After returning home where his stepdad focused most of his free time on humiliating him, he struck up a relationship with an elderly paramour who taught him how to gratify his burgeoning sexual impulses through masochistic pleasure. This, predictably for him, resulted in the eventual attempted murder of his mother. She survived due to his sloppy inexperience and he served four years in prison. Upon release, he spent the next two years getting caught for every crime he attempted. Most of them were fairly petty until he began a relationship with the prostitute who he made suffer the degradations of sexual torture until he was overcome with the intrusive idea that he must kill someone. The end result of this is what we witnessed in the opener, and then we meet back up with him at the end of his 10-year stint. It's a fine fall day. Whilst eating gruel and packing his things, we learn that he earned his parole by cooperating in prison and, when questioned by the psychologists, never wavering from the claim that inside his head, all he ever visualized was flowers. Of course, he secretly believes most of this unjustified because his mother did survive the ordeal after all, and despite understanding the rehabilitative goals of his sentence, he really can't shake the urge to get his wiry hands on someone to torture. Against that backdrop, we soon find him dressed and ready to re-enter society. He emerges into a strange new world in a town he doesn't know. No longer confined to a room, he feels the unlimited potential of the open world washing over him in waves. This time, he knows things are going to be different, not in the sense that he's fundamentally changed. He knows he can't do anything to stop his urges from taking over, but in the sense that he's determined this time to not get caught. Since he didn't have anything else lined up for release day, he gets right to it. He goes to see what's changed with coffee since he first went away, and enjoys the company of some pretty ladies. He's delivered an unsolicited sausage, which he eats ravenously. As he ponders his options, it becomes apparent to him that the girls are basically begging him to show them what he's made of. But he has to be careful, you see, and there are too many witnesses. He needs a quiet place, which circumstances conspire to provide for him as he's bullied out of one cab and ends up in another that happens to be piloted by a delicate young woman. He leans forward in an awkward manner to unlace his shoes for a good old garroting. But he's so lost in the thoughts of what he's about to do, he doesn't hear her questions about what he's up to or notice her unease. Being a seasoned caddy, she has no qualms about pulling off to confront him. This shift in the balance of control sends him mewling into the woods like an injured kitten, leaving all of his earthly possessions behind. Once the coast appears to be clear, he shakes this off and continues on in a much more relaxed manner. He finds himself serendipitously wandering up another private drive to a beautiful home that appears to be unoccupied. As he takes a lap around the perimeter to confirm this, it begins to dawn on him that this is his house. It's perfectly off the beaten path and represents the ideal, secluded spot to return with his victims, which will allow him to do whatever he wants for however long he wants to. Once he recognizes this, it's just a matter of locating his key and making himself comfy. Once inside, he feels a familiar tingle in his loins that causes him to be certain there's someone in his home. He attempts to verify this and nearly creams his pants in anticipation. However, Papa. 
There is no pleasure to be found in this victim, who really just confirms that others will be returning at some point soon. Sure enough, as he seeks out a prime location, the remaining family members return. They settle in, preparing a nightcap and getting the vehicle situated in the carport, while the loyal hound goes on a hunt and finds himself staring into the eyes of a fellow predator. As they amble about, there are a couple of close calls until Mother finally notices the status of the bedroom window. In response to her announcement, Sylvia is bowled over on his way to the front door, but he's not running to flee. He's running to quickly trap them all in together. He then enacts his plan by awkwardly binding Sylvia to a doorknob so he has plenty of time to address his grandmother's proxy. It is slow going and intensely awkward, but the memories of all the degradations he was subjected to make the effort well worth it. It's an opportunity to expel the buildup of shame that's been weighing down on him for years. Afterward, he needs a release, so he retires to the kitchen for some refreshing H2O. In the lull, Sylvia very deftly acquires the knife while her bro be slithering like a big old slippery snake. You know he's been practicing that. But a ringing phone brings him back into focus, so he disarms Sylvia and goes searching for his third victim. As he tries to find the best leverage point for this strangulation, his mind drifts back to the time he tried to kill his stepdad but didn't have the strength to get the job done. In an effort to work smarter, he instead hoists him upside down into the tub and lets gravity work for him. Now plans and ideas are starting to come together in his mind. He imagines how great it would be to see the fear in grandma's eyes by forcing her to rest them upon her dead son, and then take as much time as he'd like with Sylvia. But when he checks on her, she's no longer moving. He attempts to dance her back awake so she may get the full experience, but it's not working. Sylvia notifies him that she requires special medicine to help keep her alive. Seeing that she could prove helpful, he cuts her free of the doorknob and does this supremely awkward little rolling crab walk into the kitchen where she identifies the appropriate medications for him. He begins administering them, hoping that introducing a high volume in quick succession will cause her to pop back to life faster. But this doesn't happen, and in his frustration, he accidentally kills the lights. Sylvia proves to be very good at remaining quiet and still, as he becomes frantic now that each step of his hastily thought out plan begins to unravel. Despite her relative safety, Sylvia opts to throw herself through a plate glass window. Alerted to her location, he gives chase and catches up with her in the utility tunnel. Now, out of necessity, he must push things toward fruition, turning his master plan into an abject failure in every sense, as he thrusts himself into a stupor while she bleeds out underneath him. Fully expended, he lays here amidst such a variety of different fluids all night. With a new morning comes a fresh perspective. Sure, the prior evening didn't go as planned, but that's one of many to come. And now he already has the bodies he needs to instill the fear he craves to see in others. Imagine setting them up to be discovered by his future victims and the terror that will shine through in their eyes. It's enough to make a man, a certain kind of man, violently erupt in his pants, as he does so right here. He fires up the diesel and brings her around so he may begin loading the corpses into the trunk. Once they're all nice and snug, he runs back inside to get himself all cleaned up. He can't walk around covered in dried blood, and his clothes are a mess, so he just needs something to help him seem inconspicuous, like he belongs in most normal environments. Once that's been accomplished, he's on his way, but the idea that he has solved the issue of premature expiration gets him so jacked up that he plows into the back of another car. He is very quickly swarmed on all sides. The pressure this induces causes him to go into a frenzy and take off, always under the judgmental eyes of the dachshund. Recognizing that he's still slathered in viscera, he pulls on some driving gloves, a fine accent to his person costume. Very soon, he's pulling up to the coffee house where he intends to enact his plan this time. All the same normal customers are there, and he acts casual in his formal tales in order to lull them into a false sense of security. This time, manic over the fear he's prepared to cause, he decides he'll take them all if he has to and he draws them out to have a look at his wiener. But no sooner does he get out there than do the police arrive in pursuit of a hit-and-run offender. Remembering that his plan was to not get caught, he tries his best to insist that this is not even his vehicle, so he can't know anything about the thing that they're here for, whatever that may be. He can't get them to leave. 
but it ends up not mattering much to him because as the crowd grows, the idea of how many people he will instill fear into takes over and a calm washes over his body. If that wasn't too much for you, be sure to check out this video next. And now that we're here, I want to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.